Hello and welcome. My name's Jack and welcome to my Nostalgia Podcast. This is Jack's Throwback Attack. So if you, like me, were an avid kids TV viewer in the 90s, you might remember this guy. It's a pleasure to have with me right now, Jez Edwards. Hello. How are you doing, pal? You all right? Yeah, not too bad. Thank you. Yourself? Yeah, absolutely magic. Thank you very much. Good to speak to you. And you, thank you so much for taking part today. Um, so, of course, uh, we're chatting today about, you know, those days uh, in, in kids' television. Um, and I wanted to ask, actually, how did you get into the world of telly all those years ago? Um, I started off as a runner. I uh, worked for a few production companies in Manchester and then went to BBC Manchester. And I was like a post-production runner, so I looked after everyone that was in the edit suites. So glorified, uh, glorified T-boy, basically. Um, went up to production runner um, on the Sunday show, um, which had like Katie Puckrick and the, the birth of Dennis Pennis, if you remember him, uh, back in the day. Um, and then, yeah, kind of, start, I was just pestering people. I had uh, a laminated CV and a VHS showreel and uh, pretty much anyone. Uh, producers that went through the doors of post-production, I was pestering and putting my details um, in front of them saying what I wanted to do. So it was always with a view to being a presenter. Um, yeah, and then kind of moved over to ITV where I got a... Um, we did a, a pilot series of a show called Fantastic, um, which was a kid's kind of cookery show. And then, um, yeah, a production runner and a contestant researcher, warm-up guy um, for um, a couple of kids' shows over there, Name That Tune, that Mark Spate did. And then whilst I was working on that, I finally got my break and uh, landed Crazy Cottage and Sticky for CITV. Yes, I was going to move on to that, actually, because I do remember watching Crazy Cottage and I thought that was such a great show. Um, For those who perhaps might not remember the show or the memories are a bit fuzzy, could you describe the programme? Um, I'll give it a good go because speaking of memories, fuzzy, I've had two kids in the past five years and my head is mush. Um, but yeah, Crazy Cottage was an absolute mad game show. Um, pretty much the premise of it was you had to do things backwards to then do them forwards. It, it was kind of um, like quite a, a manic um, game show. Um, you had to get things wrong to get them right, um, quick fire rounds. And of course, there was a kitchen that was on like a nearly a 45 degree <laughs> angle. Um, and the kids had to kind of make pizza base uh, towers and um, try and. Well, stay on their feet, basically, which no one ever did by the time that all the slush and slime and all the ingredients had come piling out of the cupboards. So, um, yeah, that was Crazy Cottage. It sounded like good fun to work on. It was absolutely brilliant. Um, I, it was my first production um, as a presenter. Um, we did uh, 10 shows in five days. Um, and, yeah, by the end of that, I felt like I'd run into a wall. It was amazing. Um an amazing experience and fantastic, but so much work and just kind of obviously the the nerves and, well, thinking, (laughs) thinking constantly for a week. Uh, Who knew it'd be tiring? Yeah, it was it was a really good show, and uh, I I can remember. I mean, I was quite small at the time when it was on, but I do remember being at school one day and being really excited because Crazy Cottage was was coming back or coming on, and just going home and just being really excited and just you know bouncing off the walls for half an hour. So. <laughs> oh, nice, oh, nice. Well, weirdly, I mean, I'm I go in to work in schools quite a lot at the moment, and uh, yeah, I had um, a head teacher the other day came over to me who had actually taken part in Crazy Cottage, which made wow. me feel incredibly old. But um, yeah, it was a lovely thing. Oh, wow, that's uh, that's really cool. Um, going back to one thing you mentioned, I have to say my favourite favourite part of that show was that kitchen game. And I'll try and um, describe it for, for, for people who might not remember, but like you said, it was a kitchen that was on a, a steep slope, but the through the magic of the camera angle, it looked like it was flat and, and normal, but no one could actually stand up properly, food would fall over, that kind of thing. But I've got to ask, was it dangerous and was there any accidents? Because that looked like absolute chaos. <laughs> yeah, I'm not too sure you'd get away with doing that these days, to be fair. Um, no one ever got injured, um, but it was like chaos. I mean, there was things flying out the cupboards, all props and stuff like that, and uh, so you're getting hit with those. Then add four kids um, into that mix as well, boiler suits and crash helmets, and um, 
yeah, they had crash helmets. I didn't. So that I wasn't getting looked after, thinking back. Um, but, yeah, basically the, the flooring of the kitchen, and by the end of the week, it was ridiculous. You'd just walk one foot on it, and then obviously you were straight down the bottom because it had a week's worth of sludge on it. So um, it was so slippy, um, come kind of show 10, if you like. Um, but no injuries, just it, it was just brilliant. Have you ever tried to run while you're laughing? No, I can't say I've ever tried that. <laughs> well, pretty much you can't. Um, so trying to climb and put all the effort and energy that we required to base, uh, make these pizza towers and everyone was just in stitches. It was absolutely fantastic to do. Really enjoyed that. Yeah, it looked like really good fun. And I do remember it. And I will admit I have uh, watched it back on YouTube a few times. Good stuff. And the other thing as well, and I, th this is the nerd in me really, but what's that? that cottage set really all connected up? Because I do remember the, the, the front of the cottage, the outside was quite small. And when you went inside, it was really big, like a TARDIS. Was it all really connected up or was it all separate and ruined the magic? Um, the front door that you saw us going, we all piled through um, at the beginning was separate to the rest of it. But um, the kitchen, um, the kind of, we played one in a toilet, didn't we, with the black and white tiled floor? Yeah, yeah. And then there was the quick fire round. That was all one set. So you could go in and out and up the stairs to the door that you got into the kitchen and stuff like that. So uh, the front door and the front facade, basically that was us coming through and then into the set. So two different shots. Uh, I, I was hoping it was all really connected, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> and... Um... This is also going to sound really geeky, but this is the kind of thing I find interesting. But where was it filmed? That was in Central, in Nottingham. Um, yeah, so I did my first two um, CITV shows from there and did um, Sticky Live from there as well, in okay. Nottingham. Um, one uh, final thing about Crazy Cottage, there was also Vera the Cuckoo, voiced by Steve Nallon, who previously worked on Spitting Image. Was he good fun to work with as well? He was absolutely amazing. He's such a talented and clever fella. Um, still keep in touch with him. Um, but, yeah, it was brilliant. I mean, I love working with puppets anyway because it uh, just brings a different dynamic. And uh, most puppeteers I know have uh, got quite a, a cheeky, naughty side. Um, but, yeah, it was lovely to have him as my sidekick. Good stuff, good stuff. And you mentioned Sticky as well. Now, I'm going to admit, I don't remember that programme, but you, tell us about it. Yeah, it was short-lived, uh, to be fair. Mick Robertson of uh, Magpie fame um, produced it and um, basically it was to go up against Blue Peter. Um, so we were live, it was myself, um, Gail Porter. Um, and, um, yeah, so basically it was a live magazine show. And, yeah, a live magazine show, pretty much one of the first films I did. Um and anyone else who's going to be a presenter, make sure you know when you're filling out your questionnaire forms for producers. Be careful what you put down, because uh, on there there was a bit about your worst fear. And uh, I'm not a fan of sharks, to be fair. Um, actually, I've got nothing against sharks, I just don't really want to meet one. Um, and then the first thing I do, I'm feeding sharks up at Edinburgh Sea Life Centre. Um, so that was one of the first films that I did for that, which was ridiculous. <laughs> was you quite scared at the time? No, oh, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, they, they had a, the other diver, obviously, just having to see a couple of bubbles come out of his uh, uh, breathing apparatus, and I couldn't see for the bubbles that I was creating because I was breathing so <laughs> heavily. It was, uh, yeah, it was amazing, amazing experience, uh, having to tell the tale, but uh, probably wasn't in the tank for as long as I should have been. <laughs> that sounds like a, quite an experience. Uh, the other thing as well, um, around that time, you, you, you were thrown into the world of Saturday morning television presenting Mashed. Yeah, fantastic, happy days. Yeah, up in Newcastle, that was Time T's television, uh, myself, um, and again, I had a, a puppet um, chimp this time as a sidekick, uh, Jarvis from Dudley, and um, that was voiced and operated by Simon Buckley, who's the... Uh, one of my closest friends still. Um, he was uh, my vicar at my wedding. So he oh, OK. Ceremony. So did you know that he was a, a vicar now? No, I didn't know that at all. Uh, yes, yeah, yeah. Looks after St Anne's in Soho. Oh, OK. Um, he, got, he got ordained um, in Birmingham uh, a few years after uh, we finished Mashed. Yeah, absolutely brilliant time. So up on a Friday night, um, have a quick script run through. 
and then go meet the guests at the hotel and then, yeah, live Saturday morning. So we did that for a couple of years and then we handed the baton over to uh, two lads. I thought they were going to do better than they did, but, um, yeah, we handed over to Ant and Deck um, <laughs> on our second year and obviously they've flown from there. Absolutely. And uh, tell us some more about what it was like working with Simon Buckley. Was it good fun? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, in his previous incarnations, he'd been Nobby the Sheep as well. Uh, from Ghost Train fame, so uh, yeah, very experienced and again um, cheeky, um, naughty at times. But um, yeah, I'd just that was the best of times. To be fair, all the different guests that we had on. Um, uh, well, obviously it was the start of Steps, <laughs> the start of Five. Um, blimey, um, just loads of different kind of home and away and neighbour stars coming on and. Um, and, of course, I got to do all the, the Hollywood film star junkets as well for MASHED, which was amazing. So, uh, again, for MASHED. So this was with, still within the first year of me working. I was sat opposite Jim Carrey, um, obviously doing an interview with him about Liar Liar. And then that was quickly followed by Arnold Schwarzenegger, Will Smith, uh, George Clooney. Um, yeah, absolutely. I was blessed. But, um, yeah, really good times. That is actually quite amazing, really. I was going to ask about that. What 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 guests stick out as your favourite? Um, not only the fact you were th- you know you were presenting a live Saturday morning show, which is kind of you know the 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 the, the king of of doing kids TV, the you know the the, the major yeah. the major thing. Um, but not only that, you were you were interviewing all these big A listers. Yeah, well, yes. I mean, uh, a Saturday morning go mashed but obviously was a really small budget. So, um, but we had some we had brilliant content. We had like the Animaniacs, all the Warner Brothers stuff. Uh, we had Batman as well. So we had really um, kind of hardcore fans of that. I remember getting stopped going into a club in Newcastle by a bouncer who said I wasn't allowed to go in because Batman was cut from the show. Uh, we went, <laughs> I think it was Formula One was on, so the show had to be shorter. Batman was cut, and the <laughs> and a bouncer in a club in Newcastle was very upset. Um, so it was a mixed bag of people watching. Um, but yeah, Hollywood A-listers as well. I mean, I remember going in to interview Gary Oldman and, um, I always went in, basically we had this thing where Jarvis knew all the, um, knew all the stars. And in this instance, actually Simon Buckley, the puppeteer of Jarvis had worked on Lost in Space, which was the film I was going to interview Gary Oldman about. And, um, so basically I was telling his PR people that this is what I'd be saying. And they were like, oh, um, be careful. Cause he's just had an argument with someone. Um, one of the press had upset him and I was like oh good great and so I was already nervous because I think he's an absolutely amazing actor uh, so I knock on the door I put my head round and the uh, first thing that came out of his mouth I went oh me and my son watching you um, last Saturday I was absolutely gobsmacked it floored me I was like oh nice thanks so um, and uh, needless to say it was a great interview and played along with the whole Jarvis angle that's a really great story that is like, that's, uh, that must be quite an experience yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It was brilliant. I mean, best people. Well, Will Smith kind of gives everything in interviews. He still does. He knows how to do it. And uh, the other one who's an absolute gent and knocked on the door, um, you're only going to get seven minutes. You get sat down in front of people and they're normally just waiting in a chair and stuff. I knocked on the door and the door opened and it was George Clooney opened the door, shook my hand at the door. I was like, <laughs> kind of going, oh, hello. I didn't expect a, that sort of a, a welcome. But yeah, he's an absolute gent. Fantastic stuff and all good memories. And um, did you appear on any other CITV shows around the time? On CITV? Yeah. Um, well, I kind of guessed it's done um, quite a few. Um, but uh, go back. No, that was it. After the back of Mashed, I found out that I was going across to... Um, I'd been poached by the BBC. So um, from Mashed, I went to Record Breakers. Yes, uh, I was going to ask you about that, actually. Um, it was a long-running show, and uh, what I wanted to ask was, were there any particular records that you took part in that stand out, and did you manage to break any? Um, so, again, one of the first ones, um, still got it on my website, actually, because I went through when I built my website, kind of just put the whole montage of loads of clips, because each year you kind of do a fresh show reel to show you what you've been doing, and blah, blah, blah. but for the website, I just thought, right, you know what? I've got so much stuff, I'm just going to stick it all together through the years. And there's a bit on there from Record Breakers, which was, it was um, the 
most people in a human mobile, so like a baby mobile that hangs over the cot, um, above Leith Links in Scotland, and it was with the Circus of Horrors um, cast, basically. So we were craned up above Leith Links, and basically it was just a metal plate with the rod up the back, and you had a little kind of belt over, and then obviously suspended from this crane, which was mad. And then obviously you had all these acrobats and kind of stunt performers, and I remember getting to the top of that, and I had my own camera um, to film myself up there as well. Um, so that was jazz cam, and someone was like basically making the thing shudder by kicking. I was, that was my first experience of being taking part in one, um, and that was pretty scary, only just because someone thought it was funny to scare me even more. Um, we've been involved in the biggest custard pie fight. That was brilliant, um, <laughs> but we we failed on that um, on that record. I've been so many, to be fair. Um, my favourite of all was a massive stunt, which was um, going to be the highest tightrope walk between two hot air balloons. I obviously didn't take part in that, but I was in one of the um, helicopters um, that was going round, so I was basically commentating on what I was seeing, and that was above uh, the pyramids in Egypt. So for a setting and a record attempt, it was absolutely amazing. Absolutely brilliant. But yeah, Record Breakers just gave me an opportunity to travel the world, to be honest, to meet loads of kind of, well, mad <laughs> in the best possible way, uh, people. And uh, yeah, I got to experience so much. It sounds like it was a really great experience. And I have to say, you are very brave because I couldn't do those things. I'm absolutely terrified of heights. <laughs> yeah, no, again, I'm not bothered about heights. It's, that wasn't too bad. It's just then someone <laughs> making it feel less safe than it actually was. Again, one of those things probably now you wouldn't even get to attempt the record to be like what's our presenter standing on and it, it wasn't much i can assure you <laughs> and uh after uh, record breakers i uh, do also uh, remember you presenting exchange the magazine show on cbbc which was a show that aired almost daily for a number of years it must have been quite demanding to do that absolutely yeah um so i was part of the first cast of it where we would just it was a holiday show so pretty much if well, if you go back as long as I do, Why Don't You used to be on, which was a show for kids, but presented by kids. So it was kind of like an incarnation of that, if you like. But um, So we got lots of viewers to basically give us what they loved doing hobby-wise, and it was a show for them, made by them, but then obviously pre- presented by our team. Um, so it was in the holidays first, but then when CBBC went digital and uh, they got their own channel, um, Exchange was their flagship show, so we actually basically started the day off and uh, finished it off in the um, the evening. So basically we were live twice a day, um, which, yeah, that is, um, it was a lot of shows, put it like that. Yeah, it's funny you mention it actually, because uh, while I was doing a bit of research last night, I did actually come across that clip from the launch of, of the CBBC channel and that first exchange. Um, yeah, it must have been to do one show first thing in the morning and then one last thing in the evening. That must have been gruelling to do. Yeah, it's like kind of perpetual jet lag, to be fair, because, I mean, you'd be in a makeup chair or be into the studio for like kind of half five in the morning um, getting ready for the first show. Um, we were an hour and a half live in the morning, um, you go away, um, obviously go back to go back to bed. There was either a sleeping room at studios, or if you live nearby, you could nip home. But there'd be, yeah, you'd have about three hours kit, then you'd be up again into the studio, ready um, to kind of rehearse and then um, go live again in the afternoon. So, um, yeah, it was weird. Started having dreams about the... Um, the crane camera coming across the bed at night when I was sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew it was having an effect on my life. Yeah, because um, the thing is, you've, you've got to be energetic and smiley the whole time. It must be it must be quite difficult sometimes when you're tired. Yeah, well, um, no, it's, it's the studio, I absolutely love, well, I love live TV and I love the atmosphere of a studio because, um, like, cast and crew, production, all become one team, um, all striving to get the best results, to be fair. Um, and the exchange team worked so hard in obviously the amount of content that you need for 10 live shows a week um, is immense. So it was, it was a really big team. Um, so, yeah, and then when you're at the front of that, you've got a responsibility anyway. So as soon as that red light comes on, that's your pickup that you need. Um, and obviously the guests that we get, I mean, 
Um, for us, obviously, it was hard work, but then you see the kind of pop acts like S Club 7 come through the doors and they would like be like shepherded in to the makeup room. They were asleep in the makeup chairs when people were doing their makeup, kind of basically pushed out into the stage. That was so, so kind of interesting to see them switch the professional switch because, like, you know, five minutes before they were asleep and then now they've given a performance in the live studio. Um, so. Yeah, in terms of how hard it was, we certainly worked, worked, worked as hard as they were. And uh, from from all the different things that happened on the exchange, because there was a lot of different games and features, are there any particular moments that are memorable? Ah, uh, loads, loads and loads and loads. We, um, yeah, I, I always loved the game shows. Um, we had uh, Harry's Need to Know. It was Harry. It was a little um, hamster. We made him run around a little kind of assault course and whether we landed that kind of gave us a fact or whatever we needed. Name that poo. We had um, different animal poo that got uh, brought in from uh, London Zoo every week. Um, obviously, probably not high up on people's um, taste-ometer. Um, <laughs> good taste TV. But um, that was brilliant. Uh, kids loved that one. Um, lots of different game shows. But yeah, again, it's just kind of Getting out and about, we did massive kind of road shows with Exchange, which was brilliant to get out and about and see everyone that was watching. Um, and then, yeah, just a guess. one of my favourite memories, basically coming in for an afternoon live show, you pick up your script, you read through, and then you, have, you block through with um, the crew working out where you're going to be for different things. And we had Last Ketchup coming in, um, Spanish sisters. Um, I won't sing it for you. I won't put you through that, but... Um, <laughs> I'm sure you can find it if you Google it. But, um, yeah, so they came in and we were doing a cooking item with them. And they arrived about half an hour before we went live. So we'd rehearsed it without them. Um, and then I got one of our production team came over to in my ear and whispered and went, uh, Jez, there's a little snag with um, last ketchup. Um, they don't speak English, a word of it. And I was like, OK, brilliant. Uh, bring them on. <laughs> so basically we did a cooking item where I was speaking in English and they were just speaking in Spanish. Obviously, uh, we'd <laughs> I got no idea, <laughs> but we made a Spanish omelette. Um, and yeah, it was it was a very funny episode, but born out of um, just a little bit of lack of research, I think. <laughs> yeah, just a little bit. I'm assuming you can't speak a word of Spanish either. I can't, to be fair. Yeah, I'm not saying that was bad on them. It was, it was just it makes it difficult when you're supposed to be interviewing and running a cookery <laughs> item. Um, so they just spoke in Spanish, and I hoped that they were being good. And, um, yeah, did it in English. So that was it. I'd love to speak Spanish. It'd be amazing. <laughs> good stuff, good stuff. And uh, so uh, moving on from the, the days in kids' telly, I did have a read of your website, and, and you've since gone on to present you know, a lot more grown-up telly, but also some acting as well. Yeah, that's right. Um, kind of, yeah, it was um, a director at CBBC that kind of basically said, you should be doing more of this, because we did lots of kind of sketches within Exchange and stuff like that. And um, I got to, I was on um, Chuckle Brothers, as a coachman, which was my first taste of acting, which was amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, so basically Paul and Barry, uh, God love him. Um, yeah, they were there. Um, it was like working with absolute legends. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Um, so obviously I've met you kind of your Will Smith and people like that. It was the Chuckle Brothers coming through the woods um, to the location that we were setting. It was like, oh my word, it's like a dream case scenario. Absolutely brilliant. But that was my first taste of acting. And... Um, yeah, kind of pushed it from there, to be fair. Um, a few little kind of slots on Coronation Street since. Played a policeman in Emmerdale. Um, um, there was a soldier in a, a big Christmas um, commercial a few years back. So that's been nice and just ticking along nicely. Um, but that all came out again from when I finished on CBBC. I went over to BBC Seven uh, Radio and we did a show called Big Toe uh, Radio. And that was all about kind of books. And uh, so I did a lot of narration and uh, yeah, found a love of voiceovers and things like that. So when I came off telly, it was like voiceovers, radio, and then I was basically pushing the acting side of things. Well, I'll definitely agree with you on one thing. The Chuckle Brothers are legends, and I did meet them myself a couple of oh. years ago after a show, and it was just like the happiest moment of my life. It really was. To have a photo of them, to have their autographs, absolutely fantastic. And such a shame that the Barry is no longer with us. 
absolutely. And uh, yes, yeah, the one thing you mentioned just, and I've, I've got to mention this because it absolutely blew my mind when I read your website and realised you were in it because I didn't spot it the first time around. But you were in that famous Sainsbury's Christmas advert about the Christmas armistice during World War One, And uh, just tell us all about that, the experience of being involved in such a production that was very poignant, so brilliantly done and done with a lot of respect and a lot of attention to detail. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the, the director basically had, had a grandfather and it, it stemmed from his memories of his granddad. Um, so obviously, well, with something like that, um, he had to pay it the utmost respect um, it was a ve- it was a very secretive um, commercial. So basically, even uh, through the casting, we didn't know who it was for, and um, and up to the last moments, we weren't given the details. So uh, that's how secretive it was. Um, but yeah, I went to the um, audition, and it was just one of those things that kind of like everything, just just you, you know when you've done a good one anyway. So I walked out there, kind of going, oh come on, this will be brilliant. Um, and actually, when I got to the actual location and was going into makeup and wardrobe, they had pictures of who they, um, basically their images of who they were casting. And basically, the makeup lady went, after they put a moustache on me, she said, come over here. This is who you are. And it was like looking, it was like looking at my Uncle Noel, to be fair. Um, but basically, me and a moustache of this soldier, uh, serving soldier, basically come back and he had his twins in his arms. And I was an absolute doppelganger um, for this guy. Unfortunately, there was no name or record of who he was. I'd love to have known. Um, but, um, yeah, it was amazing. But if you're looking at the percentages of how you get a casting job, I was a spitting image of a soldier that they had a picture of. Um, and that's how I got the gig. Yeah, it was such a, such a great advert. And it was just one that, you know, I think really struck a chord with the whole nation when it, when it first went out. It was absolutely epic. It was like movie proportions of uh, location shooting and stuff. And it was my first night shoot as well, where we were obviously singing um, Silent Night and the kind of snow falling and stuff. It was really quite um, touching and emotional to do it. Yeah, it must have been. And it taught people a lot as well, because my, my mum didn't know about the Christmas armistice before that advert. I did through school, so it taught people a lot of stuff as well. I don't think a lot of people knew that really happened. Oh, yeah, well, it's one of those stories where, yeah, you might have heard about it and you kind of go, oh, no, someone's just dramatised that. But, um, yeah, actually happened. Uh, all the, the forces kind of uh, had a little kind of Christmas um, meet-up, basically, put their arms down and uh, played. There was a football game that, kicked off in the middle of no man's land. Um, yeah, just uh, a lovely kind of human story out of, well, it was an absolute tragic and horrific time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I did have a quick look at it again last night, and on YouTube, that advert's got over 20 million views at the moment. Wowzers. Yeah, absolutely. Well, yeah. It's, well, it's, yeah, again, it was so secretive. Uh, going up to it, you kind of go, oh, you know, I'm hoping. Obviously, you're thinking of a Christmas advert, then you're thinking of the actual material that we were then going to be do, uh, touching, and you're kind of going, oh, I hope this goes well. Or, you know, it's in safe hands, and obviously the job that they did with it was absolutely epic. So, um, yeah, really proud to be a part of it. And it was a very realistic set. Where was it filmed? Uh, we were out in Ipswich. There's a, <laughs> there's a farmer who's basically dug out kind of trenches and has his own um, no man's land. So it's actually farmlands that already has the kind of set there. Um, and he has it for kind of educational purposes and stuff like that and uh, maybe a few reenactments as well. But, um, yeah, so it's an enthusiast that obviously they found out that he, he's got his own trenches. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, he's meticulously made them. They were amazing, absolutely fantastic. Great stuff, great stuff. In a, yeah, in a, in a field in Ipswich is where it was, just to kill a bit of magic. Fantastic stuff. And I did see you in Coronation Street a few years ago playing a radio DJ um, alongside Vic Reeves. And I'm a big Vic oh. and Bob fan, so what was it like to work with him? Absolutely amazing. Uh, to, again, turned up and uh, I was sharing a dressing room with him um, as a, a guest star. And was, I mean, obviously it's like, ah, one on Coronation Street, two, Vic Reeves... Uh, he was going under Jim Muir, actually, for uh, Corrie, and he had a big kind of um, part where he was, I think he was trying to con Rita out of the uh, the cabin. And um, But, yeah, that was that was his first opening scenes, which was at the radio station. 
So, yeah, absolutely buzzing I was that day. Um, he's an absolute gent, as you'd expect, and I got to be in scenes with um, Norris and Mary as well, who were absolutely brilliant together. I love them on the street. Um, but, um, yeah, again, another thing I'm proud of. Uh, if I could get a dream gig, Corey, come pick me up. So uh, a 20-year-long uh, career in Corrie, that would be nice, mate. Well, you've heard it here first. We'll have to start the petition. Get Jez Edwards on Coronation Street permanently. Yes, please. That'd be great. Love that. Who <laughs> <laughs> uh, wouldn't? Well, Jez, it's been great hearing your memories of uh, working in kids' telly. And if anyone wants to keep right up to date with what you're doing, uh, watch your website, watch your social media. Uh, JezEdwards.com is my website and at JezEdwards1. Um, on Twitter if you want to follow me like that and uh, next thing I can tell you I'm doing I'm back at the Carriage Works Theatre in Leeds in Panto this Christmas so if you're uh, in and around Leeds at Christmas packing family Panto uh, it'll be Sleeping Beauty this year um, I'm still playing the idiot so uh, that's not a stretch for me um, but yeah it'd be uh, great to see some of you it'd be great Fantastic stuff Jez it's been great chatting to you today thank you for sharing your memories My pleasure. Thank you very much, Jack. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed that, why not check out the other podcast interviews available? And don't forget to check out my blog page as well. Link is in the description. Until next time, see you soon.